Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you tonight to uh, Advent Health Medical Group, Colorectal Group. Um, this is our second webinar on the Orlando Colorectal Congress. Uh, my name is George Nassif. I am a staff colorectal surgeon here. And tonight we're going to talk about diverticular disease. Uh, we have three um, guest uh, presenters. First one is Dr. Jason Hall. Dr. Jason Hall is the Chief of Colon and Rectal Surgery at Boston Medical Center. And he's going to talk to us tonight about when is resection recommended after non-operative admission. Dr. Todd Francone comes from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. He's a colon and rectal surgeon, and he's going to talk about dealing with the difficult uh, colovesical fistula and diverticular disease. And our own Dr. Matthew Elbert from here at Advent Health uh, Medical Group Colorectal will be talking to us about 15 years of mastery of tips, tricks, and pitfalls dealing with diverticulitis. So tonight, uh, as we said, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Hall. And uh, Dr. Hall, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting our invite to come and talk to us tonight. Uh, and if you could start us off, that'd be great. Uh, everybody who is watching live, on the right side of your screen, you'll see the question and answer box there, or actually question box. Anything you have, uh, please put in there, and we'll go do some questions in between speakers, and then we'll have a nice question and answer at the end. Thank you. Go ahead, Jason. Great. Can everybody hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Good. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nassif and the Advent Group for inviting me to um, talk this afternoon. Um, uh, it's interesting that uh, Boston got hit pretty hard uh, with the COVID crisis, but we still had to do a, a bunch of resections for diverticulitis. So this is kind of like the disease that doesn't stop. Um, but what I'm going to talk about this um, evening is when is resection recommended after non-operative admissions. I don't really have any disclosures, but if anybody has any they want to give me, I'll, I'm happy to take them. Um, as you know, um, the treatment of diverticulitis has been revolutionized over the last um, few decades. Increasing numbers of patients are treated as outpatients, uh, uh, and admissions for diverticular disease have really decreased um, dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and conversely, increasing numbers of patients are treated uh, uh, non-operatively and as outpatients uh, during that same period of time. But um, this leaves a difficult conversation um, for both the patient uh, and the um, physician about, um, will I need surgery in the future? Will I have future attacks? If I have a recurrent attack of diverticulitis, will that attack be worse? And if I do decide to have surgery, will surgery be effective? And I think it's pretty important for us as providers to have some element of humility about um, the, the counseling that we give patients and also what we see other providers doing because the data that we have to address this topic isn't really very good. So where, we're, we, where we'd want you know, a randomized blinded controlled, double blinded control study we have retrospective data where we'd want a large study. Most of what we have are small case series. Um, for patient selection, um, we'd want that to be random and we really have in surgery a ton of selection bias and indication bias in our studies. Uh, and then where we want hard outcomes like disability adjusted life years or functional outcomes, we really are, are, are forced to um, review outcomes like requiring surgery or recurrence, which are obviously very subjective. Um, so as I intimated at the talk, uh, at the beginning of the talk, um, the rules have really changed from what most of us learned as residents, where there was a defined number of attacks and then you needed to have surgery. Uh, and even for complicated disease, it's somewhat more of a um, complex nebulous discussion with most patients because um, there are no clear definitions. And what I'll try to point out, um, uh, throughout the rest of this talk is the complexity of those discussions. Um, so uh, as I just suggested, um, there's been a paradigm shift in sort of the number of attacks that people um, 
uh, we're, re we're are requiring for your one to be recommended to have um, surgery. Uh, and this has evolved um, over the last few ASCRS practice parameters. Um, we just published actually, um, actually in June, um, the latest recommendations on treating left-sided chronic diverticulitis. Um, and again, it's been pretty consistent over the last three um, CPGs. The decision to recommend elective colectomy after recovery from uncomplicated acute diverticulitis really should be individualized. And you see that there's no firm number um, that's recommended uh, uh, in terms of making a decision um, uh, for uh, having elective surgery. What are some of the considerations um, that sh we should think about when we're talking to a patient who's recovered from an episode of uncomplicated disease? Well, I think the first fact that we repeat over and over and over is that the vast majority of emergency colectomies for diverticulitis are performed on the patient's first episode. And also, one thing that patients really fear is they all have a cousin or an uncle who needed to have a colostomy for diverticulitis, and they don't want to have that. Uh, and so it's important to point out that the, the risk of an emergency stoma formation after, after an initial episode of uncomplicated diverticulitis is very low. It's somewhere about 1 in 2,000. Uh, when I worked uh, at Leahy with Dr. Francone, uh, who will be our next speaker, we uh, actually looked at uh, our data regarding this. These were um, almost 700 patients with an incident case of diverticular disease. And what we did was um, we took only the ones that were managed uh, medically, um, and we found that while recurrence is common, complicated recurrence where they needed to have an emergency operation of stoma is very, very rare. So there's no real reason to do operations just to, um, to reduce the risk of a future stoma. What we can say though is that um, the number of recurrences that a patient has is a predictor of their likelihood of recurrence in the future. This is an older study, but still valid data which shows that as your number of recurrences go up, um, the subsequent risk of yet another recurrence gets even higher, as high as 60 and 70%. So it really, you know, I think at one point we were operating after one or two attacks of uncomplicated disease, then the pendulum swung to four or five. I'm not sure that's any better since some of the recurrence rates um, when we wait that long are, are very, very high in the 70% range. So if you have a patient that's doing that, they more than likely, uh, more than likely need um, surgery. This is another more recent um, study, uh, larger, but again shows the same pattern that as we have more um, readmissions for diverticular disease, you're even at higher risk uh, of having yet another attack um, a classic example of conditional probability. What's more is that uh, patients who have these recurrent uh, uh, attacks are um, at risk for something we call SUD, um, where they have persistent abdominal pain and symptoms. Uh, and you may not really find any imaging finding uh, on, this, on a, sub a subsequent CT other than diverticulosis. And this is thought um, to be caused by inflammation, um, causing changes in the enteric wall, le leading to visceral hypersensitivity, as well as changes in intestinal motility. Uh, other authors have pointed out that there's approximately a five-fold risk of developing IBS following several attacks of acute diverticulitis. And so this is something um, to keep in mind when you're counseling uh, your patients about surgery. So um, what's the best evidence that we have on this topic? Well, the direct trial was uh, published in 2017. This is a randomized control uh, open label study that um, it, um, admitted three patients with three attacks of uncomplicated diverticulitis or one attack with persistent symptoms and they were randomized to surgery or medical management. Uh, and their main uh, outcome was the GI quality of life index, which was criticized, but 
um, uh, but I'll show you the results. So um, they had a relatively equal allocation. Uh, and despite a 15% anastomotic leak rate in the surgery group, the surgery group had higher quality of life scores. And what's more is in the follow-up period, about 25% of the patients um, who were in the observational group went on to uh, require or went on to have a colectomy. So colectomies, even in a group that was, I'm not sure what kind of surgery they were doing with a 15% leak rate, um, it, surgery is still effective um, for relieving symptoms related to diverticular disease. Uh, the, there will be a replication of this trial. It's already occurring patients in the United States called the COSMIC trial. And uh, I would urge those of you that are interested in this topic to consider enrolling uh, some patients. So what do I think about when I think about uncomplicated disease? Well, I think about disease frequency. Did they have three attacks in six months? Or did they have three attacks in 20 years? The patients that had three attacks in six months are likely going to be offered surgery. 20, three attacks in 20 years usually can be managed with antibiotics or in this era, actually non-antibiotic therapy. Um, how disabled were they by their attacks? Would, did they have a long hospitalization? Are they unable to work? And then again, as we all know, what are their comorbidities, their age, their weight, uh, other associated uh, medical factors? Well, what about complicated disease? Well, anytime your body does this in time, inside your peritoneal cavity, that is an abscess, um, free air, a fistula, um, a stricture obstruction, uh, you're likely going to have to do an operation uh, because of persistent symptoms. And the only exception to this um, would be an abscess. So in, in many ways, complicated disease uh, is actually an easier conversation than uncomplicated disease. And we'll get into the abscess in detail in just a few moments. And so the, the latest uh, clinical practice guidelines suggest that elective colectomy should typically be recommended for patients uh, with diverticulitis complicated by a fistula obstruction or stricture. And that's generally in my practice um, as uh, I will offer surgery uh, to all of those patients. Abscess is a little more complicated. Uh, the data is pretty much all over the place. This is a nice study from the National Health Service in the UK, they looked at over 65,000 admissions for diverticulitis. They had a modest recurrence rate uh, of around 11%. What's interesting about the study is that patients with diverticulitis, people who got diverticulitis were sick. Uh, they had a 22% mortality in the follow-up period, and that was not due to diverticulitis. It was due to cardiovascular issues, and cancers. And so um, I think this is something that we need to sort of pay attention to, that people who get diverticulitis are often not the healthiest. Um, and uh, it may be a good indication to think about some of their other medical issues. Um, in any event, when we look at abscess, abscess was a predictor of both recurrence and um, really there was a much higher risk of needing future surgery uh, if, you, um, if you had an abscess, especially if it, it was large enough to require percutaneous drainage. This is another uh, similar study which um, uh, looked at 135 uh, patients with a CT confirmed abscess and uh, they had 40% of those come back with a recurrence, although only about 10% of them actually went on to require resection. And so I, I think a lot of this has to do with how aggressive um, the surgical group reporting is. This is another similar study um, from uh, uh, the USC group, where again, they have, these are um, about 185 patients with a diverticular abscess, about a 60% recurrence rate and about 60% of those who had recurrence undergoing surgery um, uh, 
to eliminate symptoms. This is a very nice study by um, Dr. Um, Fergal Fleming at um, Rochester. They used the New York Statewide Planning and Research Cooperative System to look up data on patients with acute diverticular abscess over an eight year period. Uh, it's important to note that initially about 30% of the patients went on to have immediate surgery. But in those that avoided um, an initial operation, actually recurrence was high, but the patient, the um, patients requiring colectomy was not that high, it was only about 8%. Um, percent. And the stoma rate was also very, very low, about 5% 5% or so. And so they argued that actually a, a non-operative approach was the way, uh, way to go. So what do we do um, when we, we, we don't have clear data? We do meta-analyses. And I think it kind of depends on where you do your meta-analysis. This is one from Europe uh, where they saw about a 25% recurrence rate uh, after man uh, medical management of an abscess, either with a drain or not. Uh, and their recommend recommendation was that colectomy should be individualized. Um, this is a study from the United States looking at much of the same data. They saw a higher um, risk of recurrence uh, and of need for surgery. Uh, and their, uh, their recommendation was that colectomy should be routine. So I think getting clarity on this issue is like this mythical unicorn that my six-year-old daughter drew. And you know she's the daughter of a colorectal surgeon because there's this rainbow uh, poop that the unicorn um, gifted us. So. Uh, the 2020 uh, practice guidelines suggest that after successful non-operative treatment of a diverticular abscess, elective resection should be talked about, right? So you don't have to do it, but you should at least discuss it with the patient as a potential option because there is a high recurrence rate. The final thing to talk about uh, in this talk is um, the utility of colonoscopy. Um, following an attack of diverticulitis. Um, uh, last year, SAGES put out um, a uh, practice guideline for diverticulitis and they recommended against colonic evaluation um, in uncomplicated diverticulitis unless high risk features are present. Um, much of the data uh, is um, based on meta analyses, which show that the risk of a malignancy in patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis is actually very low, less than 1%, but it is much higher in patients with complicated disease, somewhere in the 10% range. And so um, the, the current guidelines from ASCRS kind of mirror um, the fact that we should really be concentrating on patients with complicated diverticulitis. Um, uh, and then you can make an, a, a screening appropriate decision uh, uh, on those patients with uncomplicated disease. So uh, in conclusion, uh, patients with diverticulitis, diverticulitis are highly variable. A substantial number of them um, will not recur after successful non-operative management, uh, but surgery is still effective for management of persistent symptoms. Uh, uh, as all of you do, um, individual discussion with each, each patient is paramount and really exploring their tolerance for recurrence and ongoing sim symptoms and uh, really knowing what their lifestyle goals are is really, really important. Um, another thing to point out to many of these patients is that, um, as you saw in the NHS study, a huge number of these patients are unhealthy for a number of reasons. And I think in the future, lifestyle modification may be a really, really important um, tool in the management of, these, of this disease, getting these people moving more, um, losing weight, and eat, eating a healthier um, diet. 
thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak. Some of us say, you know, wait six weeks. Some say just do it in a week or two. So when you do decide to do a colonoscopy, um, how quickly will you do that after a hospital admission when they go home? Um, I missed the first part of your, your question. Right. You were muted, but um, uh, I, I, think I'm, I think I know what you're getting at is sort of like what, what is the interval between an acute uh, presentation and um, the classic teaching has been wait six weeks. Actually, there's no data to support that. Um, mm -hmm. There actually are a few um, reasonably um, sized, um, uh, well, smaller sized randomized trials from Israel that show that you can do it um, much earlier, sort of like in the like the two to four week range. Um, although I'm not sure unless there's like a real um, pressing uh, need uh, to get the information that that I would really push it that early. I think the four to six week range works fine. The only issue becomes like if the patient has persistent symptoms and kind of needs an operation, they're just not getting better. Um, like sometimes I will push it up into that three, four week range just so we can have the information and go ahead and get the patient better. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Next is uh, Dr. Todd Francone, and he's going to be talking to us about dealing with a difficult diverticular colovesical fistula. Yes. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, George and uh, Matt and John, everybody. Justin, for inviting me to Advent Health and uh, Jason, great talk. Um, so I'm going to be uh, meant deal uh, talking about uh, dealing with the difficult diverticular colovesicular fistula, uh, switching gears a little bit from uh, what Jason was talking about. Uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, just some brief kind of um, background slides. You know, colovesicular fistula doesn't just occur in diverticular disease, although it's the most common uh, cause for it in about 65 to 80% of patients. Uh, it, can cause, it can be the result of a cancer in 10 to 20% of patients and then less common uh, in Crohn's, uh, longstanding Crohn's colitis. Even uh, less common causes could be atrogenic, from surgery, colonic stents, acute appendicitis, pelvic radiation therapy, or even penetrating trauma. When we talk about diverticular disease, it does fall into this complicated, complex category along with uh, strictures uh, and perforated diverticulitis that Jason was talking to us about in the end of his last talk. Uh, the most common diverticular fistula is the colovesicular fistula, followed by colovaginal. This is mainly related to patients who've had a prior hysterectomy, and there's no barrier between the colon and the vagina. You can also get a colocutaneous fistula. Perhaps the patient had an abscess that was uh, previously drained. So for diverticular disease, uh, the fistula occurs in about 2 to 8% of the patients, and they typically occur between 55 and 75 years of age, and they're uh, more common in males than females. There are some theories that it's caused by either perforating disease where an abscess is walled off by the bladder and the colon, and then the sepsis is festering and wears down the bladder uh, wall and creates a fistula. But more commonly, I see the subclinical smoldering disease that patients come into the office, they stay, they start the passing platelets through their, with their urine, and they've had no episode of uh, prior diverticulitis. In either case, the target organ that helps wall off this uh, inflammation is gonna be any organ surrounding that part of the colon. So it could be the small bowel, it could be the vagina, and then more commonly the bladder. This is a study in 2012 by Humes, and this looked at, it was a case control study uh, looking at general practice data, and the risk of complications uh, in a function of uh, episodes of diverticulitis. So those patients who had more uh, episodes of acute diverticulitis were 1.4 times more likely to develop a fistula to an adjacent organ than that included uh, polyvesicular fistulas. There was no association associated with uh, strictures or um, perforation or abscess. These patients usually present with lower urinary tract symptoms. They, 90% uh, of them will present with pneumaturia or flatus in the, in the urine. Uh, about 70% will fecal urea and less commonly suprapubic pain, dysuria, urgency, frequency, uh, and then gross uh, hematuria. 
very rarely do we see somebody uh, presenting with urosepsis, although I have a patient that will watch a video that presented that, uh, with urosepsis multiple times. So there's typically time to do a diagnostic and work, uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnostic workup. Um, we can often uh, get these patients to an elective uh, surgery and be treated non operatively the, the number one step in management really is to control the, the sepsis, whether this is uh, related to an abscess or they're presenting with recurrent urinary tract infections. Uh, that sepsis should be controlled beforehand. And it is uh, worth considering ruling out um, cancer in these patients who are presenting from uh, uh, with a colovesicular fistula uh, as a cancer can represent uh, development of that for about 10 to 20% of cases. So historically, we uh, did fluoroscopy either with a cystogram showing a filling of the bladder and then entry into the uh, small bowel uh, or the uh, colon uh, or a water-soluble enema with filling of the bladder um, uh, upon entry of the uh, uh, gastric uh, um, dye into the rectum. But uh, you know, more recent CT scans have obviously uh, taken the place of this. Uh, this is a CAT scan of a, a recent colovesicular fistula, and you'll see uh, the thickening of the colon as it comes down. Uh, and then you'll often see thickening of the bladder wall and with some air on the CT um, within the bladder. Uh, so oftentimes these patients get oral rectal contrast. You want to avoid IV contrast because that could uh, light up the bladder and uh, you won't be able to see the rectal contrast go in. Um, you'll see, obviously, diverticulosis and the, again, bladder wall thickening. CT scans can also be helpful in regards to the etiology of the fistula. So perhaps patients that should go quicker for a colonoscopy are those that have a high suspicion of uh, they're not responding to treatment and maybe there's a suspicion for cancer. Those patients should go on for further evaluation. Also helpful for potentially seeing the fistula tract. Perhaps you can see it closer to the base of the bladder near the trigone, and that may help with preoperative planning. So um, colonoscopy, flexible signoscopy is usually uh, part of the first workup just to take a look, make sure that this is actually a benign disease, um, especially if the patient has not had a colonoscopy. Obviously, if the patient had a colonoscopy within the last year or so, you may wish to just do a flex sig at the time of the operation. Uh, but um, for the most part, this should be considered. Uh, usually don't identify the fistula location. If so, then perhaps they have a bigger fistula than uh, you might expect and uh, getting urology involved for possible bladder repair uh, may be uh, in your best interest. Now bladder evaluation tends to be uh, a little controversial whether you need to have a cystoscopy or not. In fact, the risk of having bladder cancer is quite rare, ranges between two to five percent. And so I've talked to several colleagues in regards to whether everybody goes and gets evaluated by uh, urology. And it was probably 50-50. The majority of us, I prefer to have them worked up in the preoperative setting uh, I don't like uh, surprises uh, in the operating room, uh, but some will just have them uh, do the cystoscopy at the time of uh, stent placement at the time of the operating room. Uh, the findings are pretty nonspecific. They include edema, erythema, and ulceration. Oftentimes you're looking for this in the relation to the uh, ureteral or orifices. And so again, uh, if it's low and it's near the trigone, perhaps you wanna have stents placed and have urology involved. Some preoperative considerations for these cases. Uh, you might want to document preoperative urine uh, culture just to have uh, that documented. These patients may require, will have uh, potentially have urinary tract infections after surgery, and, might, uh, and that's helpful to document that it's not related to your surgery. Consider uh, urinary stents. Again, this is a, for me, and I'll talk a little bit about this more selective. Stoma marking and teaching, and then considering the, the timing of the surgery. So, are we, how often, how soon do these patients need to go to the operating room? And I think that obviously is based on an individual uh, patient basis in regards to if they're having multiple recurrent ur urinary tract infections or that they had an episode of urosepsis, then we really potentially want to get them to the operating room sooner than later. Some intraoperative uh, considerations. Uh, these pa uh, patients can be performed minimally invasive, but it's a uh, surgeon choice, uh, hand assist, laparoscopic, robotic, uh, all data suggesting that this is safe and feasible. One of the benefits to hand assist and open is the ability to uh, pinch off the fistula. Usually get your finger sweep behind that uh, uh, fistula and just pinch it right off of the dome of the bladder. That's a little tougher to do with a robot or laparoscopic, but uh, certainly feasible. Uh, a lot of these patients can be, uh, fistulas can be concrete, and so uh, that's not always possible in an open setting. Uh, perhaps uh, having methylene blue available to uh, look at the opening in your uh, target 
organ or mainly the bladder. This will help you decide whether or not you need to repair that fistula site or not. You should be prepared that uh, patient uh, for potentially fecal diversion. These patients can oftentimes come in with quite uh, bad disease. Their surgery can be uh, uh, quite difficult. Uh, and so they should be prepared for uh, temporary or even permanent stoma if needed. A few words on ureteral stents. Uh, you know, the, the word of uh, the guidelines are that the uh, stents will help you with identify the ureters, uh, but don't prevent the ureteral injury. And the data um, suggests that that's uh, pretty much uh, uh, the way it stands. This was a, a review, systematic review in 2019. No randomized control trials were included or found in the study. Uh, the most frequent indications for prophylactic stents were diverticular disease, neoplasia, and uh, IVD. Uh, and for uh, intraoperative ureteral injuries with stents was approximately 1.5% versus uh, without 0.2%, uh, uh, although that wasn't statistically significant. Uh, for intraoperative recognition of the intro, inter, uh, <coughs> intraoperative ureteral injuries uh, with stents, um, was approximately 62.5% and without stents was 52%. Uh, uh, so again, not a significant difference. And so, you know, you can consider uh, their conclusion of the, the study was that this should be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and obviously for more complicated disease, uh, consider placing stents. And that's how um, I'll uh, practice for myself, uh, selective use, low fishes, possibly uh, involving the trigoon, place some stents. Retroperitoneal abscess or uh, inflammation or even presence of hydronephrosis will have urology involved. This is, uh, there's alternatives to having stents placed. This is uh, a video of my partner, Dr. Goldstone, Robert Goldstone, um, uh, I borrowed from. Uh, you can see here, he's identified the ureter, just confirming with uh, ICG fluorescent angiography. This obviously comes with the robotic system. Um, you know, so you'll say, well, you can see it. What do you need the ICG angiography for now? Uh, but if you have a case like this where there's a significant amount of inflammation, not quite sure where it is, you can see that that ureter gets pulled into the phlegmon of the diverticular uh, segment of the uh, sigmoid colon, and you can frequently check to see if this is uh, getting swept in the right direction. So um, I think it is, uh, you know, there's no data suggests that this uh, prevents injuries, but it's certainly uh, something that, um, you know, uh, is at your disposal if, if you find this helpful. So what are some operative tips? And I'll have a couple of videos going through these. And these are just some of the things that I think about. I typically will do the splenic flexor mobilization first. And this really kind of allows me to keep the patient flat. And then once that's mobilized, uh, we'll place the patient in Trendelenburg. And then I'll focus on the uh, pelvis and where the sepsis is. If I need to convert, I can often do this through a fan and steel or even a, a small inferior midline incision. I often uh, try to do a medial lateral uh, when possible. It's not always feasible because of the inflammation and these uh, colons are, tend to be very taut and pulled down into the pelvis. But this allows uh, early ureteral identification and I can sweep that ureter out of the way. And this may facilitate some of that sidewall dissection that can be really dicey and especially where the ureter can get pulled into the phlegmon. When I'm talking to residents and we're, we're watching them operate, we always stay, stay close to the colon. You're wandering out towards the side while you're wandering out towards the retroperitoneum. That's where you're gonna get into, into trouble with the ureter and other structures. You really need to stay close to the colon. Uh, when you're doing the, the, the uh, heart of the dissection, that colon's going in the bucket. So stay close to it um, and stay out of trouble. Uh, have a rectal sizer, a flexible sigmoidoscope available. This can help, often help you uh, identify your, your true sigmoid colon as often and your rectum, because there's usually these patients have significant sigmoid loops stuck in the pelvis and sometimes you can get easily lost. Again, methylene blue, checking for the potential osteum of the fistula, at least in the, the bladder. Uh, and then uh, consider a mental pedicle flap as a barrier for some of these cases. So this is a, a simple, uh, what I would say is a simple colovesicular fistula, a 50 year old male and just kind of taking a look around here. And it's mainly just right at the dome of the bladder. And you just, we just started taking this down right off the way it looked simple enough. So we haven't mobilized this front flexure yet. And uh, these are all robotic cases. It's just a, a surgeon preference uh, for, over uh, laparoscopy. Uh, Jay Hall and I uh, both have a, a wide experience in both straight and, and hand assist, but I find that the robot has, um, really helped with some of these fistulas because of the concrete nature of the inflammation. So it may look like that this is the, um, 
the fistula opening here, but it's really gonna be over here on this side of the wall here, right in this area. And you can see that the sigmoid loop is really kind of nicely being pulled off. And then this is what I would consider is something simple and doesn't require repair. And I uh, typically wouldn't put a flap over that and uh, did not check it with methylene blue, although um, there may be a certain uh, um, uh, surgeons out there that will check everything. Once I kind of mobilize off the sidewall, then we'll go back to do a, a medial lateral and then um, finish the case. This is a, another video here, a little bit more complex, uh, morbidly obese, uh, another uh, mid 50s uh, male. And you can see here the induration and the uh, uh, adhesions to the sidewall are quite significant. We've already mobilized the splenic flexure for this case. So the patient's in a, a Chandelenburg position, slight right tilt. And again, just kind of working it off the sidewall, just trying to get a feel for where it is. And what I'm looking for is that sigmoid loop to see if I can get behind uh, this uh, sigmoid colon. You can notice that as we're using, doing the dissection, we're staying on the colon side, staying on the yellow fat, stay, trying to stay out of the sidewall and the retroperitoneum, very easily to go to wander. This is the right side of the pelvis and I'm starting to see some, some hint that there might be a loop. You can see this fat down here on the lower end. Here's the fistula, you can see granul uh, granulomatous tissue here. We're just getting into the fistula and just gonna try to separate that. I, again, you know, will hug the colon more than the bladder, try not to make the bladder opening bigger than it really needs to be. And oftentimes you really don't require repair. So again, just coming behind that fistula here, and you can see that this, this doesn't always pinch off, especially in the open, uh, open procedures. So again, getting behind this, you can see the loop here, and then we're slowly starting to separate this from the bladder wall. This is the anterior wall of the rectum and the sigmoid, continuing to separate that from the left side wall. And you can see here, just straightening out, taking down these small adhesions. They may not look like much, but they can prevent your size or your stapler from going up. Left pelvic sidewall still looks a little bit challenging here. So we'll, we'll go to our medial lateral dissection. Lifting up on the IMA, we'll get underneath and you can see here this little fat pad is usually what I look for. Once I lift that fat pad off, up, you usually can find the ureter a little closer to that area than you would if you were digging through the fat, especially in the morbidly obese patients. So once we get that ureter down, we can sweep it down. We'll take the IMA at, on, in this case, just to give us some, some, uh, some room to work. You saw the ureter pop up again. And we're gonna sweep that all the way down towards the sidewall. And then we have a little bit of freedom to kind of move along that sidewall with some confidence that the ureter has been swept away. So again, if you stay close to your colonic fat, you should pop into that medial lateral plane without, without injuring your sidewall. You can see here my assistant's in and out with the, with the um, irrigation and the sucker, and you really do need a good assistant for these cases that it really does make the difference. So just taking, again, taking down these adhesions here, straightening out that rectum. We'll even mobilize the uh, posterior along the TME plane. You know, I know this is benign disease, but you know, getting into that medial lateral plane, sweeping down these structures really does help mobilize this tissue, which can be very uh, stuck and uh, difficult uh, to deal with. So again, just kind of mobilizing that left side, ureters lateral. And then you can see that the sigmoid and the rectal sigmoid are now straight. And then you can proceed with your, your normal sigmoid resection. You can see the upper rectum there. Just doing a rectal sizer. I like to make sure that the rectal sizer and the EA stapler are gonna go up, so I staple at the right spot. We've come across the stapler, we'll do our anastomosis. And there's uh, plenty of data showing that uh, restoring intestinal continuity uh, is safe in these patients. About 15 to 20% of them may require fecal diversion. I do oversew all my anastomoses. And then we'll perform a flexible uh, sigmoidoscopy for an anastomotic leak test. In this patient, we did perform a methylene blue test that did, uh, which showed no uh, leak. 
um, but uh, ended up reinforcing the um, uh, fistula. This is oftentimes one of the best places for uh, residents to suture. Uh, so it's often their, their, their turn to uh, suture the fistula open and close, and then they'll tack the uh, omentum up in place as just a barrier between that fistula and your anastomosis. So this is a, probably one of the more complicated cases that uh, I've done for a clofascicular fistula. You can see here the small bowel uh, had walled off. She had multiple abscesses. She was an 80-year-old female who presented multiple times for urosepsis. And on their last admission for urosepsis, they figured out she had a fistula and uh, had colorectal involved. We cooled her off in regards to getting her sepsis controlled, and then we took her to the operating room. She was incontinent, so we had planned to perform an enclostomy from the beginning. Uh, but we thought she would benefit from a minimally invasive approach. You can see here the small bowel was separated from the mesentery of the colon. We just straightened out the uh, small bowel and then reinforced it. This bowel was inspected uh, through a fancy when we extracted the specimen and confirmed that we were okay in regards to our repair. You can see that we're now we're separating the colon from the the uterus and this lopian tube is also mixed in here. And you can see we get into a very quickly get into an abscess. And very fibrotic, very phlegmatous uh, mass here down in the pelvis. So this sepsis has been sitting here for quite some time, not easily separating from the uterus. Ur um, uterus. Here's the sigmoid colon, and then here's the dome of the bladder. You see, we're not a clear plane here. We've already mobilized her splenic flexure before we um, started this uh, portion of the procedure. So we're just kind of mobilizing lateral, same as the other cases, approaching it uh, laterally, trying to get this fistula down. We'll go medial lateral when we don't have a good plane and it's more stuck. We're going to identify the ureter and sweep it down out of, out of harm's way. And once we sweep that ureter down, we're going to sweep all the way down towards the pelvis and sidewall. Again, trying to give ourselves some room uh, to work along that left uh, sidewall. Once that ureter is down, we can, again, take our IMA pedicle just because uh, this is going to be an extensive uh, dissection. Getting into that avascular or TME plane can be very helpful. You can see here that the majority of her sepsis is down in the pelvis. And even without a colobacicular fistula, you can have sigmoid loops that are very difficult to take down. You can see here, we're getting into perifascicular fat. And so we're in the wrong plane here. And, and there really is no plane, uh, but we're trying to separate that uh, dome of the bladder from, from the uh, colon. This is not even the location of the fistula. That's how bad the sepsis was. Probably most of you are wondering why I haven't converted yet, but we did make uh, a fair amount of progress uh, throughout the case. And so we have good visualization here in this pelvis. You can see here, you know, what we're looking for is this, you know, loop of sigmoid colon that we showed we reduced multiple times before. We're just not seeing it on this case because the inflammation of the uterus, uh, you know, the sigmoid colon stuck to the uterus and the fallopian tubes are all folded into the mix here. So we're not seeing any clear plane on how to get through this. And we kind of, you know, very easily get lost in this uh, inflammation. And we're trying to stay uh, along the sigmoid colon and not get down into the mesentery. The posterior um, plane was developed, but even that had a lot of inflammation. Here we were able to get it off the dome of the bladder and we're just identifying our, our hole, uh, in the uh, hole in the bladder. And uh, urology was present to help with that. So we're, we're not really sure where we are. We're not sure how low we are. So we put a flexible sigmoidoscope in there to help us identify the colonic, uh, the, the, hopefully the anterior wall, the rectum. We're gonna improve our exposure by tacking up the, the uh, uterus now that it's uh, more free. You can see that we've made some progress in the pelvis, but still no nice clean rectum to, to, um, to uh, attach to or even to staple across. So here we had a rectal sizer placed in and we just cut down on the rectal sizer and that identified the lumen of the rectum. And then once we were able to do that, we cut along the remaining uh, rectosigmoid and sigmoid colon uh, along the uh, lumen of the, of, of the bowel, and we're able to reduce that out of the pelvis and really clean that pelvis out. So 
since we were doing a uh, end colostomy, we oversewed the rectal stump. Uh, and again, this was uh, you know facilitated by the ability to suture in the pelvis with the robotics. And then this was a dual layer, double layered closure. And then we went on to uh, close uh, the bladder uh, with urology. And this was a double layered closure as well uh, with the VLOC in the first, uh, which was a running. And then he his preference is an interrupted um, vicral. The, uh, we do test the bladder repair, obviously, and the Foley catheter stayed in for two weeks for this patient. And then an omental pedicle flap uh, was placed above the repair. And again, this is really more for a barrier between your anastomosis and, and the repair, um, but uh, routine for, for me with these fistulas. So, um, you know, in regards to, you know, minimally invasive surgery for colovascular fistula takedown, uh, you know, surgery uh, does lead to some low, low recurrence rates and the rate of conversion to laparotomy is reasonable, uh, ranging between, you know, 33% to, you know, 20%. Uh, anastomosis is commonly done um, with some good success. Uh, ours was an elective uh, Hartman's procedure, but you can see here, variable rates here, but they can go as high as 35% for a Hartman's procedure. But again, some of these cases, uh, that's a selection bias, and, and some of these cases can be quite challenging due to the chronic inflammation. So it's routine for these patients uh, to be enhanced recovery. Uh, we typically don't uh, give post-op antibiotics um, unless indicated, uh, even for patients with con contained abscess, such as you saw in that video. Uh, what about routine cystograms? Uh, should you do them? In, in our practice, we typically do do them on day uh, five, uh, but the data, uh, when you're looking through the data shows that there's really no difference, meaning the majority of these papers show that when cyst the, there was really no positive cystograms for patients that underwent, uh, underwent bladder repair. More recent uh, retrospective review with uh, Brothelson in 2017, we looked at 78 patients, about 35% of them had a laparoscopic assisted surgery, 40% of them had ureteral stents and 27% had complex bladder repair similar to the one that you just saw in the video. And of the ones that had post-operative cystogram about 70%, only 4% uh, had a positive uh, leak uh, on the uh, cystogram and they were all complex repairs. Early catheter removal was uh, associated with being older, intraoperative methylene blue test uh, being negative and then a simple bladder repair. So, you know, perhaps not everybody needs a cystogram going home. So what's some take home points? Really, uh, these patients do require some preoperative thought and preparation. They are gonna be challenging cases. Really need to have early identification of the ureter. You need to stay close, and close to your organ of preference, which is the colon, um, in, in regards to uh, what we can repair and what we can fix. Uh, and that minimally invasive surgery is a safe and feasible approach to these patients. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. All right. Thank you, Todd. That was great. Um, we do have some questions coming in, but I think we're going to go right to Matt, and then we'll do a question answer opened up to everybody uh, at the end uh, for time's sake. So Dr. Albert is from here in Orlando. Um, he is going to talk to us about tips, tricks, pitfalls dealing with diverticulitis. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm glad I could be with you. If you can see me, the, the product placement is very intentional. If uh, any endorsement possibilities out there, it'd be great. Uh, I'm gonna go straight to uh, videos with this. In fact, I have absolutely zero slides or zero text to read. Uh, so you're gonna have to listen to, uh, to my wisdom. I think my videos are gonna come through a little bit better because we're uh, here at the Nicholson Center in Orlando and uh, we're running it directly uh, through my computer. Um, the real thing is the uh, amount of disparity and variability in diverticular uh, surgery. Uh, I think we as colorectal surgeons contribute somewhat to it because we are not often the ones taking care of the acute cases. Um, this is a uh, first one, a patient who presented with a diverticular abscess, fairly sick, um, not a drainable window, and came into me with 30 pound weight loss about a month later. Uh, there's no doubt, actually, that I would have done this probably while she was in the hospital. So the first thing is often taking off uh, this small bowel loop just uh, in that section. You can see this is why it's undrainable. But the key is, you can see it's just walled off by mesentery there. Follow and dissect the mesentery uh, out. I often don't attack the uh, disease right away. In fact, I usually don't at all, but in this case, 
Um, I just want to get the initial bit of small bowel out of the pelvis. It's in pretty uncomplicated. And look at that uh, mesosigmoid abscess there, uh, of which you see the sigmoid is really pulled down as well. And so I make very few stomas. I can't remember the last time I did a Hartman procedure. I don't believe in the dogma and bad advice we've gotten over uh, 50 years of diverticulitis. Um, I've never found it beneficial uh, at all. Geez, I think this video stopped um, right here. Yeah, let's do it. All right, never found it beneficial to wait six, um, it's stopping the videos. So, do the questions. Todd and Jason, a um, couple questions came in. Uh, first off, uh, with your sigmoid resections for diverticular disease, do you always take or mobilize the splenic flexure? I think uh, for me, uh, no, it's a case by case basis, but I think the majority of time, I think uh, because a lot of times the, you know, the sepsis is in the pelvis, if I do do the splenic flexure mobilization first, what will happen is I'll just make a quick assessment if I think I'm going to need the length. Um, <laughs> And you know, we'll go from there. We'll oftentimes approach it like underneath the IMV. We'll do my medial lateral dissection, get the splenic flexure mobilized, and then again, so with robotic surgery, trying to minimize the movements, um, put the patient in Trendelenburg position, and then uh, work on the pelvis. Okay, Jason, how about you? I'll speak from behind my picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also use. Uh, here, I'll start my video. I also use a selective approach, um, much, although I have to say, most of the time, the majority of the time, I'm gonna take down the splenic flexure. Because what happens with these folks is they've had an abscess that's been sitting right on the top of the proximal rectum. And that area, when you go to make the anastomosis, is always a little strictured, a little bit stiff, and so when I go to make the anastomosis, I'm never happy with it because it feels stiff and it feels like a little bit cardboardy, for lack of a better term. And so I'm always going to want to take the top of that rectum and I always want a little bit of length. So if I have like a skinny, you know, old lady who's like 85 and I'm doing the operation on her, like the splenic flexure is probably not coming down. But for some of the cases Todd presented, like, big obese people, you might as well just take it down at the start because you know you're going to need the reach and the top of the rectum is going to suck. So you're going to have to like do something. Yeah. I mean, you, you really have to take the opportunity. In those patients, when you have your exposure, you got to take your opportunity there. Uh, you usually get one shot at mobilizing splenic flexure on some of those patients, especially if you're going to do some medial lateral work. Um, when you first get in, the bowel is still in the pelvis, you really kind of it is nice not to try to get your perfect positioning and then right, shoot it back to me. Yes. So. Okay. It's working. Shoot All it right. back. All right. Matt says, shoot it back to him. We'll get some more videos in. We'll ask some more questions later. So what I was saying, I, I disagree with a lot of the uh, dogma. I've never found it to be any easier waiting uh, six weeks and making a patient wait six weeks to have a surgery that I knew they needed. Uh, still the same rates of sphincter preservation and the same ability to do it laparoscopically. We do these exactly the same every time. And the, the real thing as far as diverticular disease, it doesn't matter how big of a bomb went off in the pelvis there. The fact is, um, is that you can always find normal colon to operate on. And to make an anastomosis in the end, you need a conduit and you need a good distal target. I equate this to the exact same thing as vascular surgery. You need a distal target and uh, getting a, a good uh, rectum is uh, critical. Uh, the second thing, I mobilize the flexure every single time, and the biggest reason is uh, it's always normal, and it opens up the entire pelvis to the operation. Uh, and so here is the medial lateral approach. We get under the superior rectal. Instrument goes under here. The fellow is always operating with the two instruments on the left. That's my instrument behind the pedicle. The next argument people have about what level you divide the IMA, this has been never shown to uh, uh, cause a decrease in blood supply or, or decrease in uh, or increase in anastomotic leak rate. Uh, because once you take that, the fact is it's just opened you up right into the pelvis. 
the ureter is able to be pushed down, the nerves are able to be pushed down, and the more lateral that you go, uh, the better. And so again, uh, I normally don't uh, go right to the pelvis, but this is one, a fairly fresh, uh, uh, big phlegmon that the patient had. The first thing that you'll do is always just divide the omentum right across it near the sigmoid so you can flop it up. Uh, again, small bowel involvement in this, and this can almost always uh, be just taken off uh, sharply. There's always a little abscess cavity there, so air on the side of the colon, and you'll always pop and do a little something. I've never seen one of these fistulized to it, actually, like you would with, diver, uh, like you would with Crohn's disease, less penetrating. Uh, but you can see, I've already done the rest of the case, and I mobilized the flexure also because I know and am guaranteed that every single time I have a good proximal conduit. Then all I need is to take out the mess and have a good rectal stump at the end. And so uh, I will nearly uh, never divert unless the rectum is beat up from an abscess there um, or based on systemic or clinical factors uh, from the patient. Uh, next one. Uh, similar to what you saw from uh, uh, Dr. Frank Cohn, uh, but this uh, puts some of the, uh, you know, experience uh, uh, in this. Uh, you can see, again, a complete mess down there. The appendix is down there. The cecum's down there. So uh, you can see the appendix is down there. And the first thing that I do when I see this phlegmon is to see, is there a distal rectal target? is there despite this bomb that went off above and you can see here that i even can pull up this sigmoid loop here so at this point i don't care what's stuck up there that i know once i get below it that i'm going to have a good rectal stump at the bottom so again fast forward 17 minutes it takes us about now with this patient with the fistula and neurologic problem you can get the ureter right down you can get the ureter uh, uh and then right into the pelvis you can get the nerves down um and so here's real time working with it. You can see the appendix is actually transected in half. I just pulled that in uh, with the ligature device. Uh, but here's the real problem with laparoscopy. And it's the one nod that I'll give to, uh, uh, to robotic surgery, of which I do a fair amount of now for complicated diverticular disease. We don't have the instrumentation, a good monopolar cautery. And you just don't have the torque with laparoscopy like you do with robotic instruments where you can literally rip this off uh, with more force than your hand. But some of these, uh, from experience, you look at this, I have about five centimeters of uh, plastered fistula to go through. I've already gone into the abscess cavity. This is real time, so you can see how slow I'm working. And this is where you have to pause and say, okay, wait a second, what, uh, what, uh, what am I trying to do here? I have this giant perforated colon. I, I left the stool splattering in the lens for a reason. You got this big perforated colon. It's gonna take me 30 minutes to an hour to chisel this off the bladder, of which I then have to remove this 10 centimeter specimen out through an incision. And so in my uh, experience these days, depending on my patient's level, and also you wanna take a look at, good at the bladder, uh, and knowing that there's a big sigmoid loop down there, this is when you make a quick fan and steel incision, Finger fracture this off, divide your proximal colon. That's all that work's already been done because it's easy to do pelvic surgery through a fan and steel incision. It's hard to do a splenic flexure mobilization. And so you do all that work beforehand and it can work out uh, um, uh, much, much, uh, much, much easier for you. I don't think there's a, a point uh, in, in torment in some of these. Let me just get the... Um, So um, another one, uh, like I was saying, this was the one that stopped. You can see this is more acute. This is why I actually favor doing these early rather than waiting for six weeks where patients really don't get all that better. And it's much more edematous and peels off very easily. Uh, we take the small bowel uh, off again um, in this patient. Skip that part that we saw before. But once you get this big, giant, gross phlegmon up, and it takes some real work to uh, uh, pull it up there, that there you go. Perfect success right down to the pelvis. You got the rectum. And at this point, you know that you have a perfect you know, distal target there. 
there's no reason to divert based on how gross of the disease you uh, uh, had. Um, and then uh, one more that I'd like to uh, show you is, um, so this patient presented with this thing right here, the 15 centimeter pelvic abscess. This is where no way I'm giving them early surgery. You can see the rectum just splattered uh, to it uh, underneath uh, there. You get a good look at this. So this is, she came to me six months later, still with a drain and contrast shooting up the descending colon. So she has a fistula now. So just in case you were worried about the setup, same setup every time, right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and super pubic five millimeter trocar. So the fellow and assistant is doing all the work up top and uh, I'm just moving retraction around. Uh, and so in this one is much more complex. Todd mentioned the theme as well, getting that sigmoid uh, loop out. Uh, and in this patient, I know there's lots of stuff down there. In fact, I don't know if that's cecum, I'm kind of rolling that around. I think that's coming under small bowel mesentery. But now I say, oh, wait a second, there's the pelvic loop down. So I start separating between the loops here, but I'm going, what is this diverticulum? Am I taking the small bowel off? But then I say, wait a second, that's colon coming up. So if that's colon coming up right there, uh, then I need to find uh, where that loop of small bowel. So there it comes. Uh, I often, you come from below, and you can see with blunt uh, dissection, we can take this uh, uh, small bowel off. This is where the abscess was, and this is where the drain still was. Uh, but slowly um, removing piece, organ by organ. So now I'm separating the small bowel from the sigmoid loop that went down, came back up, and is going back down. And interesting now, when you look and pull the small bowel up, uh, you'll see. Uh, but we're getting the rest of it from the pelvis. This is the kind of peel you expect um, after waiting, you know, six to eight months uh, to do this, kind of peels off like that. Um, you can tell the difference from the chronicity than uh, from the one before. Um, but uh, so this is from having that chronic abscess where I think this very likely would have been uh, easier uh, early on. So the last second you see that the small bowel loop is actually pulling one more loop of sigmoid uh, off. So it's going up and down and up and down. Uh, Next part, now, lateral sidewall. This is where the majority of the disease is. When you perforate it out laterally, uh, this is where you go. So at the, you gotta hug the endopelvic fascia. As soon as you get on the wrong side of the peritoneum, the ureters threaten. Look at one more loop down here. That is why people have impassable strictures on colonoscopy with a loop like that. But at the end of this, in this patient, you still see, because of that chronic abscess was on the rectum, you kind of have this stiff fibrotic rectum, not very good distal target. And this is where I will any day of the week incise the peritoneal reflection and make a extra peritoneal uh, anastom an anastomosis on extra peritoneal rectum. I'll take a few centimeters loss of rectum any day for a much nicer, safer anastomosis. In this one, actually, you could see how thick the uh, anterior Denon VAs was, which I think we were just unfolding it. So at the end of the day, you need a good proximal colon, which you can get every single time with adequate mobilization. You need a good distal target, which is almost always there. If it's not there, have no uh, shame in going extra peritoneal rectum, mobilizing it and getting a nice healthy piece of rectum. You have to do this every time during endometrial surgery. I don't uh, ever wait for patients to uh, go. And if I know they need an operation, I find no benefit in waiting six weeks. Uh, during that time, usually they get flares four more times. I never knew whether to start the clock again uh, or not. Um, and I think no matter how you do it, someone will say, well, you should do it nanoanatomic. Don't go that high on the pedicle. Uh, but the fact is, no matter how you do it, you gotta have a system. And if you have a system that works for you that you can do every time, you're far better than anyone else. This system step-by-step step, deconstructs the disease, allows you in the safest place. And if you do the splenic flexor mobilization first like that, your bailout is a simple fan and steel incision, which you probably needed anyways if it was that bad uh, to finish the pelvis. So we'll do a few questions uh, and answers. It was great. Um, I'm going to open up 
uh, for all the panelists. I'm going to read some questions that came in and uh, I'll appreciate any input from you guys. First is talking about stents with uh, diverticular surgery. Uh, do you routinely do them? If you do them, do you do them preoperatively or is this something that you will have uh, intraoperative, can't find the ureter, or have uh, urology come in and put a stent? So that's part of the question. The other part is, if you do stents, are you routinely putting um, ICG in there to look at it uh, under immunofluorescence? So I don't know who wants to speak first. Yeah, so um, again, uh, it's somewhat unpopular, but we grew up a heavy pra a private practice volume, you know, centered surgery before we became more academic. Um, you know, my experience is more than uh, nearly a thousand diverticular uh, resections now. If you added in stent time with that, uh, it would probably accumulate probably about a year and a half of my life if I use these routinely. Um, uh, urologists feel uh, similarly, and so it was really because of a challenging access. Uh, at the same time, when you come in from above and not laterally or anywhere else, uh, I think you can do surgery identifying the ureter safely in nearly all of them. Sure, there are some where intraoperative identification is necessary where it's really plastered on there. But using the tips that you have, coming presacrally or from the right side and leaving that plastered left side for the end, uh, doing safe sound surgery that I don't uh, routinely put stents in anyone. Uh, one ureteric uh, injury from uh, diverticular, that was uh, last year um, and more recently, um, uh, that's it. I am currently working uh, on um, an approved uh, with a pharmaceutical company looking at fluorophores for the ureter. That, that trial is actually starting an injectable ICG that's just modified a little bit to have urinary excretion. Uh, going to the, well, I'll let them answer ureteric before I jump to cystoscopy. Jason Todd, any comments on that? Routine usage of stents more than Matt uses stents? I use it selectively um, based on the pre-op scan and how plastered down to the retroperitoneum I think things are going to be. I would say it's a minority of the time, maybe 20%, and most of those will be like colovescular fistula cases, that kind of thing. Yeah, same thing here. Very selective in the where I use the ureteral stents. I, th I agree with Matt. I think if I think I'm going to need them, I'll make sure a urologist is in. Uh, and then I'll have them come in during the operation. So I can work while they're working. I typically shy away from the preoperative placement if I can, but it just holds the OR up. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, I typically don't, don't need them. My urology um, guys are really fast. I mean, they literally have them in in five minutes. And uh, I can answer emails and like, you know, round with the residents and stuff while they're doing it. So it's, it, it, for me, it doesn't really add that much time. The stents aren't for you, they're, for, they're, they're not for the patient, they're for you. Yeah. yeah there you go. All right, um, second question I'll open up to everybody. Um, this is a couple questions came in on this and I'm gonna try to combine them. So with a colovesical fistula, do you, try to hunt after the small fistula opening to close it, or do you just leave it be, number one. Number two, if you place a Foley catheter, especially now that we're doing enhanced recovery and patients are leaving in two to three days, do you routinely get imaging before you take out the Foley? Do you just have them have a Foley in for X amount of time, come back to the office and take it out? So how do you handle the fistula, and then what do you do postoperatively? Yeah, uh, you know, quite a bit of dogma in this, as, uh, uh, as we know as well, although Todd showed us some of the, the real data behind it. I think these come in uh, uh, three kind of uh, flavors, uh, phenotypes. Uh, the, the simple clean one, where there's the rarity, where you get this thing off and there's a nice clean hole and you can clean it up and nicely close it. I got nice bladder to close and a small fistula. Foley's coming out routinely day one, no cysto. Uh, the other one, though, more inflamed, uh, more inflamed, peeling it off there, kind of phlegmon on the back of the bladder, uh, tiny fistula, probably even sealed that you can close, uh, some nice tissue over. Uh, those, I keep the Foley till they go home on day two or three. And then there's where the last one where it's like a, a explosive went off in the back of the bladder 
big hole, can't really close well. That one keeps the Foley and Cisto seven to 10 days, but never a routine Cisto and rare that people are leaving with Foley's. I, um, I test them all in trials. My Albert classification. I uh, set up um, Cisco tubing with methylene blue and run it in retrograde through the Foley. Uh, and I find that most of these are very small fistulas. I mean, you have your occasional huge thing, but most of them are small. Most of them don't leak. I check a routine uh, cystogram, just a plain film, plain film cystogram on post update two before they go home and then take the Foley out. If there's some unusual huge thing that we had to do a huge repair, then obviously that's a totally different situation and you're working with urology and a lot of what you end up doing is up to them. Uh, but for just the routine filibuster fish, I think the dogma of leaving Foley's in forever and all that stuff is not, not practical for today's uh, environment. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the, um, the same, uh, um, well, go ahead, Todd, real quick. I saw you start to open your mouth a second. Yeah, I, I think, you know, <laughs> it was delayed. what I was uh, saying in the talk is that, you know, for the most part, uh, these complex repairs, the RMGH urologists are, you know, doing, uh, keeping them fully catheters in for two weeks. You know, it's their repair. They can, they can do what they want with that. But if you looked at the rest of the data, if you do a methylene blue uh, installation test and it's negative, data would suggest that you don't really need to do a cystogram. You know? Yeah, I, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm totally chicken. Yeah, I think a lot of overkills on that. And these are the things, again, I, I'm not cavalier. I, I learned through you know, experience in, in doing a lot of high volume. Uh, and it's just your same comment. How many patients where you do a cystogram, did I ever find anything? Never. Uh, it's kind of analogous to how many of the fistulas do they really see on cystoscopy too, which you can kind of predict with their symptoms, you know, when they're passing, you know, whole vegetable matters, you're going to probably see a big hole there. Uh, but most of the time, they often don't even see anything there. Uh, and so uh, despite the, so these fistulas are small, and I think we've tormented a lot of people excessively with unnecessary catheter cystograms and everything else. All right, this is a question each one of you answer separately. Um, so what, during your case, when do you give a colostomy or a Hartman's and when do you, if ever, use a diverting ileostomy with a primary anastomosis? Jason, you wanna start? For elective surgery, I have to say, my use of stomas is extremely rare, right? extremely rare. I, I can't think of the lot last time I've used a stoma for, um, for elective operation for diverticular disease. Now, um, there are some unique circumstances where you might, where I do prep the patients for a stoma, right? And, you know, those would be where you look at the pre-op scan and it looks like you're going to do a complex pelvic dissection and the rectum might not be all that healthy uh, and where you might predict that you're going to go lower than usual in order to make, you know, a safe anastomosis. So those patients all have marked preoperatively, and those might be the same patients that get a stent um, preoperatively to make sure that, you know, we can move, like stents for me actually move the case along faster, right? Because now I know where the ureter is and, you know, we can go. Um, uh, so, so for me, uh, not a lot of use of um, uh, proximal uh, diversion. Other patients to consider are patients who are on biologics for some other reason. So, you know, they have rheumatoid arthritis and they're on embryo or syndia or something like that. Um, or whether there's some question about whether they have SCAD or, or sort of like a segment of Crohn's and you're not sure whether it's diverticular disease or um, Crohn's disease. So those people I will think about a stoma more. In the acute setting, we do still take some acute care surgery call. Um, most of the randomized trial data, I think we have four good randomized trials, which suggests that the way to go is an anastomosis and loop ileostomy. Um, nobody's ever going to come out and say, you can't make a Hartman, but certainly the, the stoma reversal rate uh, when you make loop ileostomies is far higher. 
the risk of post-operative complications is lower um, in the uh, ileostomy uh, in the anastomosis group when compared to a heart med. So, uh, you know, you'll see in the most current uh, ASCRS uh, CPG on diverticulitis that actually that's a recommendation. When an anastomosis can be made, uh, you should make it and, uh, and use it regarding the deep ileostomy. Would a positive leak test change your mind at all? Usually, if I have a positive leak test, I'll redo the anastomosis. If I had like a second positive leak test, which believe it or not has happened once or twice, that's a terrible day. And so like usually God's trying to tell you something when that happens. So then you pull up the stoma. So that's the Leahy experience. <clears throat> fix that, fix that leak test, revise. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't mess around with it. I just, re, just redo it. Yep. Agreed. Todd? Yeah, you know, I'm not going to uh, repeat everything Jason told. Uh, mm -hmm. Just said he trained me, so you know, I pretty much will approach the patients. I think in the acute setting, though, I think that the, you know, if you could do an estimate, just do it. But I think you really got to take into consideration that some of those leak rates were, were quite higher than what we normally see in an elective setting. And so, uh, and at that time, if that patient has a high fecal load to, to do an anastomosis and then divert, you're really not doing anything for that patient because that patient's going to leak. You're going to have a stoma and then a take down the anastomosis and have a mucous fistula. So, uh, you know, I think in the acute setting, I think it's great that you can consider it and if the setting's right. But, you know, if this patient's in, you know, distress or there's fecal peritonitis and you don't have good tissue to put it back together and you have a high fecal volume, then I think that's a scenario where I would avoid. I agree with Jason in the elective setting. Very rarely do I have, um, you know, I quote a less than 1% of the time for conversion to open and less than 1% for diverting stoma. And that's really just a disclaimer to kind of say, listen, I, you know, reserve the right to make a good decision at the time of the operating, you know, operation. But it's pretty rare that we would do a, a diverting stoma at that time. I have a couple on here that I'm sure every one of us here in the office when patients ask you in your office uh, with diverticulitis, if they can have uh, seeds and nuts or should they stay away from certain foods, what do you say? Rapid fire, Matt. <laughs> they can have a seed sandwich if they want. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I tell them. That's my answer. <laughs> yeah. The data around this is pretty clear. Um, we've known this for 10 years. There's the health professional study, which looked at 50,000 uh, patients. And the relationship is clear. The more seeds, nuts, and popcorn that you eat, the lower your risk of diverticular disease. Um, all complications for diverticular disease. It's the only thing in the diet literature for diverticular disease that's been re replicated over and over and over. So um, there is no truth to the um, old wives' tale that uh, seeds and nuts cause diverticular perforation. Okay. Crazy. <laughs> Seed sandwiches for everybody. <laughs> All right, um, last question here. Um, in everyone's experience with the immunocompromised patient or HIV patient or patient on chemo, um, does this force you or force your hand to operate earlier? And I'll add into that uh, patients that are being evaluated for transplants. They've had an attack of diverticulitis. Um, transplant team says, you know, it looks ugly. Can you get it out? Uh, how do you guys handle these patients? Todd, so, you want to start? Jason's been doing all the Leahy work for you. For, uh, you know. yeah, no, I think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, the data is not great for the immunocompromised patients. They're usually single, you know, typically single institution studies, but I think you do have to, you know, consider operating on these patients uh, more aggressively in regards to their long-term immunosuppression. Um, they do, the data suggests possibly five times, five-fold increase in, in their risk for uh, complications from diverticulitis. So I do, you know, it's a conversation with the transplant surgeons or their, you know, you know their um, whatever immunosuppressive drug they're on. Uh, but I, I do consider it to be more aggressive with those patients. All right, anybody else had anything differently to add? We have one more question here and then we'll get going. And does anybody, uh, or shall I say, with your proximal conduit, does anybody get nervous if they look down and in their purse string is included a diverticulum? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and nobody, uh, nobody uh, loves this. And the, and the hard ones are that, uh, you know, where it's almost seems impossible that you can't find a good proximal, you know, that there's, that there's one every, every seemingly centimeter. Um, but you can almost always get one in there. If there's one right on the edge, I'll just put a suture below it and pull it back up and tie it around the stem. There's lots of little tricks to, uh, you know, avoid getting that one right in there. If it's really poorly placed and there's a tick right on it, I'll redo it even uh, in a second. Um, it is a, con and although as much of a concern it is, I can recall ever going, oh my God, it was that tick that was sticking out of the anastomosis <laughs> that, uh, that did it. Um, maybe because I, I try not to. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I do those tricks too. You try to pull them into your first string. You got to be careful because you pull one in, another one comes, pops up, you pull, you know, pull. <laughs> <laughs> and then your tissue, your donut's so big that when you close your stapler, that tissue can kind of pop out. And then you're wondering if your suture broke because you've probably tried to put too much uh, tissue in your EA. So sometimes if I have that, I think of a baker. I'll do a side to end uh, and then consider that. Yeah, that, that is a really good comment to the uh, person who asked the question and to any, uh, any learners uh, out there. Uh, yeah, you can always just put the anvil on with the spike, pull it out the anti-mesenteric border where it's much nicer and come across the end with the GIA. Usually, the only time I reserve that is for colonic obstruction when there's just a huge size discrepancy in diverticular disease with a stricter obstruction. I'm a big another fan good of reason to do it. I'm a big fan of the baker in this situation. I don't, I hardly ever make bakeries, but if I ever make when it's when this stupid diverticulum is sticking right right into your anastomosis, annoying. Okay, yeah, real good reason, well, guys. Thank you very much. It was uh, awesome having you guys tonight. Um, please look out. We're going to keep doing uh, these webinars. Our next couple webinars in the next couple months will be on pelvic floor and IBD. So everybody look out and thank you guys very much for joining us and have a great night. Thanks for inviting yeah, me. Thank you too. Wish we had time to talk about lavage and about 62 other diverticular subjects, but uh, we're gonna make a, a good uh, hour and 15 minutes and call it. In the 2021 series. <laughs> Thanks guys. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Hey guys.